Hi. Good day. Well, <laughs> hi. Uh, welcome to another installment of The Hobbit with Stephen Notman in sunny Bermuda. It's a uh, beautiful day out there on the water and uh, turquoise, turquoise waters, blue skies, pink beaches. Yeah. Um, restrictions are being raised. Tomorrow is uh, Mother's Day. And uh, hopefully <clears throat> we'll be able to go to, uh, to a club, a uh, beach club for dinner. Looking forward to that. And uh, so, you know, one day at a time. Let's hope these uh, falling COVID numbers improve. I'd really love it if we could, I could get over to Europe this summer, but um, Britain's list isn't very good. And even the places that it says we can go, like Portugal, Portugal hasn't opened up to us yet. So it's a little bit it's a little bit dodgy uh it may also be a challenge to get from the uk to france because i don't know if we're allowed to go there it's it's all whoa. anyway i i was i was hoping it would be easier to get over to europe this year than it was last year but you know despite being fully vaccinated i'm finding it's even harder now so and that's apparently well it's the great reset, God knows. Anyway, <laughs> let's escape from that crud and get into the jolly midst of our hobbits in the midst of war with A Thief in the Night, Chapter 16. Now the days passed slowly and wearily. Many of the dwarves spent their time piling and ordering the treasure. And now Thorn spoke of the Arkenstone of Thrain and bade them eagerly to, eagerly to look for it in every corner. For the Arkenstone of my father, he said, is worth more than a river of gold in itself, and to me it is beyond price. That stone of all the treasure I name unto myself, and I will be avenged on anyone who finds it and withholds it. Bilbo heard these words, and he grew afraid, wondering what would happen if the stone was found. Wrapped in an old bundle, of tattered oddments that he used as a pillow. All the same, he did not speak of it, for as the weariness of the days grew heavier, the beginnings of a plan had come into his little head. Things have gone on like this for some time when the ravens brought news that Dane and more than 500 dwarves hurrying from the Iron Hills were now within about two days' march of Dale, coming from the northeast. But they cannot reach the mountain unmarked, said Roak, and I fear lest there be battle in the valley. I do not call this council good. Though they are grim folk, they are not likely to overcome the host that besets you. And even if they did so, what will you gain? Winter and snow is hastening behind them. How shall you be fed without the friendship and goodwill of the lands about you? The treasure is likely to be your death, though the dragon is no more. But Thorn was not moved. Winter and snow will bite both men and elves, he said and they may find their dwelling in the waste grievous to bear. With my friends behind them and winter upon them, they will perhaps be in softer mood to parley with. That night, Bilbo made up his mind. The sky was black and moonless. As soon as it was full dark, he went to a corner of an innermost chamber just within the gate and drew from his bundle a rope and also the Arkenstone wrapped in a rag. Then he climbed to the top of the wall. Only Bomber was there, for it was his turn to watch, and the dwarves kept only one watchman at a time. It is mighty cold, said Bomber. I wish we could have a fire up here as they have in the camp. It is warm enough inside, said Bilbo. I dare say, but I am bound here till midnight, grumbled the fat dwarf. A sorry business altogether. Not that I venture to disagree with Thor and may his beard grow ever longer. Yet he was ever a dwarf with a stiff neck. Not as stiff as my legs, said Bilbo. I am tired of stairs and stone passages. I would give a good deal for the feel of grass at my toes. I would give a good deal for the feel of a strong drink in my throat and for a soft bed after a good supper. I can't give you those while the siege is going on, but it is long since I watched, and I will take your turn for you if you like. There is no sleep in me tonight. You are a good fellow, Mr. Baggins, and I will take your offer kindly. If there should be anything to note, rouse me first, mind you. I will lie in the manor. I will lie in the inner chamber to the left, not far away. Off you go, said Bilbo. I will wake you at midnight, and you can wake the next watchman. 
As soon as Bomber had gone, Bilbo put on his ring, fastened his rope, slipped down over the wall, and was gone. He had about five hours before him. Bomber would sleep. He could sleep at any time, and ever since the adventure in the forest, he was always trying to recapture the beautiful dreams he had then, and all the others were busy with Thorn. It was unlikely that any, even Feely and Keeley, would come out on the wall until it was their turn. It was very dark in the road after a while when he left the newly made path and climbed down towards the lower course of the stream was strange to him. At last he came to the bend where he had to cross the water, if he was to make for the camp as he wished. The bed of the stream was there shallow but already broad, and fording it in the dark was not easy for the little hobbit. He was nearly across when he missed his footing on a round stone and fell into the cold water with a splash. He had barely scrambled out on the far bank, shivering and spluttering, when up came elves in the gloom with bright lanterns and searched for the cause of the noise. That was no fish, one said. There is a spy about. Hide your lights. They will help him more than us, if it is that queer little creature that is said to be their servant. Servant, indeed, snorted Bilbo, and in the middle of his snort he sneezed loudly, and the elves immediately gathered towards the sound. Let's have a light, he said. I am here if you want me. And he slipped off his ring and popped from behind a rock. They seized him quickly in spite of their surprise. Who are you? Are you the dwarf's hobbit? What are you doing? How did you get so far past our sentinels? They asked one after another. I am Bilbo Baggins, he said. Sorry, I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins, he answered. Companion of Thorin, if you want to know. I know your king well by sight, though perhaps he doesn't know me to look at. But Bard will remember me, and it is Bard I particularly want to see. Indeed, said they, and what may be your business? Whatever it is, it's my own, my good elves. But if you wish ever to get back to your own woods from this cold, cheerless place, he answered, shivering, you will take me along quick to a fire where I can dry, and then you will let me speak to your chiefs as quick as may be. I have only an hour or two to spare. That is how it came about that some two hours after his escape from the gate, Bilbo was sitting beside a warm fire in front of a large tent, and there sat two, gazing curiously at him, both the elven king and bard. Hobbit in elvish armor, partly wrapped in an old blanket, was something new to them. Really, you know, Bilbo was saying in his best business manner, things are impossible. Personally, I am tired of the whole affair. I wish I was back in the West in my own home, where folks are more reasonable. But I have an interest in this matter, one fourteenth share to be precise, according to a letter which, fortunately, I believe I have kept. He drew from a pocket in his old jacket, which he still wore under his mail. Crumpled and much folded, Thorne's letter that had been put under the clock on his mantelpiece in May. A share in the profits, mind you, he went on. I am aware of that. Personally, I am only too ready to consider all your claims carefully and deduct what is right from the total before putting in my own claim. However, you don't know Thorn Oakenshield as well as I do now. I assure you, he is quite ready to sit on a heap of gold and starve as long as you sit here. Well, let him, said Bard. Such a fool deserves to starve. Quite so, said Bilbo. I see your point of view. At the same time, winter is coming on fast. Before long, you will be having snow and what not, and supplies will be difficult, even for elves, I imagine. Also, there will be other difficulties. You have not heard of Dane and the... Dwarves of the Iron Hills? We have, a long time ago. But what has he got to do with us? asked the king. I thought as much. I see I have some information you have not got. Dane, I may tell you, is now less than two days' march off and has at least five hundred grim dwarves with him. A good many of them have had experience in the dreadful dwarf and goblin wars of which you have no doubt heard. When they arrive, there may be serious trouble. Why do you tell us this? Are you betraying your friends? Or are you threatening us? Asked Bard grimly. My dear Bard, squeaked Bilbo, don't be so hasty. I never met such suspicious folk. I'm merely trying to avoid trouble for all concerned. Now I will make you an offer. Let us hear it, they said. You may see it, said he. It is this. And he drew forth the Arkenstone and threw away the wrapping. The elven king himself, whose eyes were used to things of wonder and beauty, stood up in amazement. Even Bard gazed, marveling at it in silence. It was as if a globe had been filled with moonlight and hung before them in a net woven of the glint of frosty stars. This is the Arkenstone of Thrain, said Bilbo, the heart of the mountain, and it is also the heart of Thorin. He values it above a river of gold. I give it to you. 
It will aid you in your bargaining. Then Bilbo, not without a shudder, not without a glance of longing, handed the marvelous stone to Bard, and he held it in his hand as though dazed. But how is it yours to give? he asked at last with an effort. Oh, well, said the hobbit uncomfortably, it isn't exactly, but, well, I am willing to let it stand against all my claim, don't you know? I may be a burglar, or so they say. Personally, I never really felt like one, but I am an honest one, I hope, more or less. Anyway, I am going back now, and the dwarves can do what they like to me. I hope you'll find it useful. The elven king looked at Bilbo with a new wonder. Bilbo Baggins, he said. You are more worthy to wear the armor of elf princes than many that have looked more comely in it. But I wonder if Thorn Oakenshield will see it so. I have more knowledge of dwarves in general than you have, perhaps. I advise you to remain with us, and here you shall be honored and thrice welcome. Thank you very much, I am sure, said Bilbo with a bow. But I don't think I ought to leave my friends like this after all we have gone through together. And I promise to wake old Bomber at midnight, too. Really, I must be going, and quickly. Nothing they could say would stop him, so an escort was provided for him. And as he went both and as he went, both the king and bard saluted him with honor. As they passed through the camp, an old man, wrapped in a dark cloak, rose from a tent door where he was sitting and came towards them. Well done, Mr. Baggins, he said, clapping Bilbo on the back. There is always more about you than anyone expects. It was Gandalf. For the first time for many a day, Bilbo was really delighted, but there was no time at all for all the questions that he immediately wished to ask. All in good time, said Gandalf. Things are drawing towards the end now, unless I am mistaken. There is an unpleasant time just in front of you, but keep your heart up. You may come through all right. There is news brewing that even the ravens have not heard. Good night. Puzzled but cheered, Bilbo hurried on. He was guided to a safe ford and set across dry, and then he said farewell to the elves and climbed carefully back towards the gate. Great weariness began to come over him, but it was well before midnight when he clambered up the rope again. It was still where he had left it. He untied it and hid it, and then he sat down on the wall and wondered anxiously what would happen next. At midnight he woke up Bomber, and then in turn rolled himself up in his corner without listening to the old dwarf's thanks, which he felt he had hardly earned. He was soon fast asleep, forgetting all his worries till the morning. As a matter of fact, he was dreaming of eggs and bacon. Indeed. Well, that's a short one. Just a couple more to go. He'll be seen as a traitor, but he's trying to stop a war by giving them something to say. Come on, Thorin. Come down out of your stronghold. Let's not shed blood over this, but Thorin is not going to see it that way. Nasty old dwarf.